I presented, I think it was back in February. It was like right in between the first big snow blizzard and the next big snow blizzard, which is kind of confusing because we had so many of them during the winter time. Uh, my name is Jeremy Edler. I am the owner and sole proprietor of Henlopen Music Therapy Services. I founded Henlopen Music Therapy Services in September. In September of 2014, I started it out as just like a kind of a trial idea. A friend in, of mine and I were talking one night. And he's like, why don't you do a, a private practice? You might as well give it a shot. So I did, and I've been going strong for about the last six months. Okay, so a little bit about my private practice. Henlope Music Therapy Services, are, my primary objective is to provide evidence-based music therapeutic uh, practices for individuals and group sessions for clients with varying needs and disabilities. So basically what I'm seeking to do is to work with families, agencies, organizations, nonprofits, grant-funded organizations to provide music-based interventions for individuals with varying special needs. The populations that I serve currently mostly are, are special needs and developmentally disabled. However, I'm looking to branch out, um, time, time permitting. I'm looking at um, dementia and Alzheimer's, adolescents and mental health clients. So anybody that falls in a large spectrum of needs, they can be didactic, it can be educational, it can be mental health, it can be behavioral health, it can be cognitive. I am a sole proprietor, so I'm not at the point where I'm in the position to be an LLC and hire other music therapists. That's something I'm considering in long term, especially when I have individuals and agencies that are looking for 10 hours a week, and I am working in the school in the daytime. Um, I mentioned earlier that grant-funded partnerships are important. I currently have a contract with Autism Delaware's Power Program which stands for Productive Opportunities for Work and Recreation. They get a recreation grant, so I'm able to work with them one hour a week through a recreation grant at Lewis Library every Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Okay, so for those of you who were not here the last time, music therapy, it's a, it's a big abstract word, and a lot of people ask me what it means, and I think I'll probably get that question till the day I die. Um, according to Brugia, music therapy is the clinical and evidence-based use of music interventions to accomplish individualized goals within a therapeutic relationship by a credentialed professional who has completed an approved music therapy program. So that's a very long, broad, abstract definition. So with that, when I look at that, every time I read through that, he actually wrote a book called Defining Music Therapy. And it was the first book I had to read in graduate school. And it was very, very abstract. So we had to break it all down. So when I look at this definition, I see clinical and evidence-based. So evidence-based to me is I'm able to take what I do, record data, present it to another professional to prove that it's valuable. So when I'm working with kids with autism, for instance, and I'm doing a specific goal based on communication skills, I'm tracking data, I'm recording data, and I'm able to provide a physical form of results. If I'm working with an individual who, or a teenage, teenager who's going through depression, it's going to be more qualitative, and it'll probably consist of written notations, journal notations, everything that would fall under a qualitative um, data aspect. Um, the Certification Board for Music Therapists, that's what keeps me credentialed. Um, they define it as a specialized use of music by a credentialed professional who develops individualized treatment, supportive interventions with people of all ages and ability levels. Um, so the goals can be social, communication, emotional, physical, cognitive, sensory, and spiritual. A lot of times when, you're, when I, I would be working, say if I'm working a contract at a, um, a center for palliative, palliative care, end of life care, we're really going to touch on spiritual needs, and you know, dealing with closure. 
Uh, music therapists have to have a bachelor's degree or higher in music therapy from an approved college or university. They also hold, I hold a MTBC, which is Music Therapist Board Certified. The CBMT, or the certification board that I mentioned earlier, um, holds that credential. So you have to follow the guidelines, you have to sit on your boards, complete your classes, sit, um, take an exam that lasts three hours long. So like, there's a lot involved in that. Um, it's evidence-based, um, it requires knowledge in psychology, medicine, and music. What is not music therapy? And I get this question a lot, um, especially when I'm talking to different agencies. A person listening to an iPod player with headphones. We can all do that, right? I assume. That probably would not fall under the scope of music therapy because there's nobody in the middle that's kind of helping you through the way or giving you any guidance. Um, bedside musicians are very beneficial, especially in hospitals, nursing homes, whatnot. And, and the sound healers. But if they don't have training in all of the aspects of music and, th and therapy, it doesn't constitute therapy. Piano players in the lobby, again, they're great and they're very valuable and important, but that's not what I do. The first thing that I would do when I'm working with clients is I'd look at the assessment process. So I would go over, you know, what we're doing. Uh, what, do you, what goals do you want to get out of music therapy? Sometimes I would talk to the to parents about that. Find out what goals they're working on in the school system, what goals they're bringing to therapy because they have a certain need that, that they need to work on. So I would look at you know, their functioning level, strengths, as well as areas of need, because sometimes you'll have clients that really have a strong you know, musical voice, and you can use that to really explore expressive speech or work on self-esteem and self-awareness. So I would do the intake, I'd evaluate the referrals, and I'd identify if there's any kind of medical pre-existing condition that I need to take into consideration. I would, I would select music based on, you know, in, with instruments and procedures. I would look at um, different ways to incorporate instruments and musical activities. Um, I'd look at the environment or space, so for me it's a matter of I'm going to them, they're not coming to me with my practice. I don't have a set building that I'm out of, so I kind of go to them. Or for instance, I had to set up, a con when I set up my contract with Power Program, one of the challenges that I came across was finding a space to have the music therapy group sessions. We had a couple organizations that were interested in offering their building, however, it didn't work out because they were looking for compensation. So I lucked out and the Lewis Public Library offered the upstairs annex to us you know, at free of charge, which was a blessing in disguise. Um, I identify how the client responds to different types of music. So during the assessment process, I might do an improvisation to see how they would respond to it. Do they like to sing? Do they like to write music? Is their cognitive level strong enough for them to sit down and dialogue and do different things? I would establish the goals and objectives, and then I'd look at the design of the session, create a therapeutic environment, music therapy experiences. I'd look at um, the goals and objectives again, and I'd create the music based on that. Goals and objectives for me, before I go on to the updates, they're very individualized. So even if I'm working with a group, I'm thinking about how does my experience affect the individual within the group. So for example, they're, very con they're, they're concrete and they often occur over a course of several sessions. So my first example is 1.0. Johnny will be able to in independently sing or utter the phrase, I need help. That is a broad goal. And that, will, that probably would not be accomplished through session one. So I'd have objectives underneath of it that would help me help that client achieve goal one. The other one, when engaged in the lyric analysis, Samantha will express her feelings in an open and honest manner with her music therapist in regards to her previous trauma. So very, very broad goals that will encompass probably at least two or three sessions depending on how far the session goes. Objectives are stepping stones to achieving the goal. So the objective is kind of like a building block. 
So it would be 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, until they've achieved that concrete goal of being able to speak expressively using that phrase. So for instance, looking at 1.1, during the singing activity, Johnny will be able to utter the word help independently at least one time when singing. So when that objective is met, then I'm looking to add more, to, more and more to that objective until they can independently say, I need help. Um, experiences that I use in Hemlope and Music Therapy, singing and recreating. So being able to perform pre-composed or written music to accomplish non-musical goals. So being, and one of the reasons why we do this is to incorporate different goals for, for different populations. So if I'm working with a client who has Alzheimer's or dementia, I will use a singing activity to help with reminiscence or maybe expressive speech if they're losing their speech or that they're at that stage of their their kind of regression, being able to bring them to that. Um, improvisation is really good for many different clients. It's really good for clients with autism because it helps them to use non-verbal verbal ways of expressing themselves in a, group cons uh, in a group setting. So they're able to communicate and learn how to use non-verbal ways of expressing themselves. It's also beneficial for clients that have mental or behavioral health issues to be able to vocalize what they're feeling in a very creative way. Um, referential or non-referential, it can be either thematic or non-thematic. Goals including self-awareness, social interaction, nonverbal self-esteem, and relationship building. Listening experiences, we do this a lot. Oh. We do this a lot um, for listening experiences. We're looking at lyric analysis. It can either be relaxation or actual in-depth discussion about what the words mean to you. Um, just a little bit of an up update. I recently purchased new equipment. I've been going strong since February of 2015, working with a contract. Each child that comes to that session brings $8 from their recreation budget. So on average, I get about $56 for that one-hour session. So I decided that, you know what, we don't have enough equipment. So I took money out of my music, music therapy budget, and fortunately it was there. I went up to B&B Music in May, and I purchased all these really cool instruments with my Henlopen Music Therapy account. And I just wanted to take some time to show, that, show what I purchased to you guys. So I've always had these bongos. These bongos were donated to me when I finished my internship and all the, the staff at Christina School District that worked in the autism program signed it. So this is nothing new, but I purchased this brand new kibasa. It's very nice. I have new maracas. I have, four, I have two sets of them. I have one in, in that wood, and I have one in the plastic. I have this castanet that you slap on your knee. Big old tambourine. I have egg shakers, and I have another drum that I have in my car. It's a uh, djembe drum. Or it's a tune back drum, sorry. And it, it came with a bag and everything, and it's, it's very, very popular with my kids. It was a little too big for me to bring in today, but I got that. And then a friend of mine who's also a music therapist, she works with um, elderly adults, donated boom whackers. I don't know if you guys have ever seen boom whackers before. So boom whackers, they're pitched plastic tubes. So... This one is pitched in D. This one is pitched in E. And the way that they work, they're color coded. So whenever you're looking at music for boom whackers, you'll see colors. And the kids just follow the colors instead of looking at the notation. A lot of times when you're working with kids with special needs, 
It's not easy for them to learn music notation. So being able to look at the color coding and just play along with the color coding, and you can kind of give that directive leadership really helps, and it, it makes them feel like they're creating music in real time. Um, I inv like I said, I invested money in the instruments. I spent about $150, including the doom back that I didn't bring in. Um, I'm continuing to work with my Autism Delaware contract. I'm also in the process of negotiating a contract with another agency. It's, um, it's a home in Seaford that I'm working with. So we're in the process of just talking out a contract and figure out how that's going to work out. Um, at this time, I'll just ask if anybody has any questions. But Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. We're, we're glad to hear about your progress. I don't know about anybody else, but when he was getting out the instruments, I kind of wanted us to play and have a therapy session, you know? <laughs> that would be great. All right, now it's a ch chance for questions and comments. Let me grab this other mic here. Nice to see you back again. Oh, thank you. Really. Pleasure's mine. I'm glad you've come so far in such a short period of time. At, uh, you said every Tuesday at the Lewis Library. What time is that? We meet about 2 o'clock. What time? 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock. And how, how long do you have the upstairs there? From 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock. OK. And if, uh, if you have individuals that you think would really uh, be part and parcel of your uh, discipline and education, how, how does one go about actually getting the degrees, et cetera, that you have to actually be supportive of your efforts here locally. Are you asking about like, how they become a music therapist? Or? Yeah, yes. In other words, what, what, what is the process? If you have an individual that you think would fit the mold that you are mm -hmm. and you wanted to give them some coaching other than actually tuning into the video that has just been created of your presentation, number one, to actually see you in action and see your instruments, et cetera. What else, uh, from a coaching standpoint, could you offer an individual who might want to do this? That's a very good question. Um, the first thing I would probably do is refer them to different websites for music therapy, especially the institutions that train for music therapy. Um, I would give them a list of all the universities that offer the program and be able to like talk them through what they need to do for the next step. Obviously, if they're, uh, if they're in high school, they say they're a high school student that's really musical and they want to learn a little bit more about music therapy, I would set them up with different pro program directors that can talk to them about what is music therapy, why do you want to come to this college, what can we offer to you, and just set them up with that and, and talk about the certification process. If they're coming in as an undergraduate, they have to take four years. Obviously, they'll be in college for four years. If they already have a degree, there are different options on the table. There are some colleges that offer just a certification program, so they can go there for about two years and get their MTBC, or they can go and get their master's equivalency, which is what I did. And I already had the music degree, but I didn't have the music therapy degree. So I had to go back and take all the music therapy classes. So I had to learn how to use music therapeutically as a therapist while still working on my graduate classes like methods of research and um, being able to do psycho, what was the class? psychopathology. So I had to study psychopathology while I was taking introduction to music therapy. So it's, it's kind of like a makeup course. I can also, I think that's something that I've, I've wanted to do and I've, I've explored that for a while was to take on practicum students. So if there's anybody that is training to be a music therapist, I can probably I can honestly say that I can probably work with them a couple hours a week to give them that supervision and guidance to teach them how to use skills and be able to take a mentor role. Uh, and last but not least, you're still associated with Cape High School, right? Cape Penelope School High. District, yeah. OK. Thank you. Hi. This was very interesting. I unfortunately was not here for your first presentation. Um, so what is your daytime job? This, it sounds like this is sort of on the side from, so you're an employee at CAVE. Yeah, I work, I work during the school year as a substitute, but I work, I, I work practically almost 40 hours a week. Um, I'm on call. I work all the time. 
then I, I work for three outlets in Tangier a couple nights a week just for extra money. And then I, I have another, I have this job and then I just got hired. I forgot to put this in my update. I forgot to put this in my update, but I just got hired as faculty for the music school of Delaware doing music therapy. So, oh, awesome. So your day job at Cape is not music therapy. It is not. You're subbing. Okay, that's what I was trying to figure out, if there was a correlation. Now, there. On, on occasion, I get to, to substitute as a music ed teacher, okay. so I will be able to use elementary music methods that I learned in school to teach, for instance, recorder techniques or using rhythm instruments in class. So I've had the fortunate opportunity of doing that, but it's not an everyday occurrence for me because music teachers don't take off every day. Right. But, yeah, I mean, it's, it is good to do that once in a while. Have you talked to anybody at the consortium in yeah, this? I have, and I, I, this question came up the last time. I talked to the principal and other administrators, and it's just a matter of not hearing back from them, and, okay. you know, we're dealing with other things. Okay. Of. I would keep pushing that because sometimes, you know, your phone number gets pushed aside and not intentionally. Okay, that sounds great. I wish you lots of luck. Thank you. Is your goal to make your therapy practice a, a full-time occupation? I'm not quite sure about that one yet. Uh, it's, it's something that I'm, I'm kind of feeling out right now. I mean, I'd love to have like a day job in the school and then have my private practice on the side and then be at music school. That would be like the ideal situation. I'm kind of mulling everything over. You know, do I want to finish my certification that I started as a teacher? So I'm just kind of figure, figuring things out. Who else has questions? Hi. It sounds like you're working under contract with the other organizations, usually. Uh, typically, is music therapy something that's covered by a, like a patient's insurance, or is that just not covered? I don't know how that works. Um, typically, no. It, dep it depends on the insurance company, but so far in my research, there's not a lot of opportunities for music therapy. I have an MPI number. I, I applied for it. It's lifelong, so I have the number, and I have it in all my information. But it seems to me, I, went th I did my research on what can be provided through insurance, and it looks like partial, what is it, partial hospitalization is the one thing that's covered for music therapy and that music and recreation therapy. And then the other, I think, is dementia and Alzheimer's, but there's nothing currently on the books for coverage for individuals with special needs. Additional questions? I know we've got a few more out here. Congratulations. I, I, I like that. I'm sorry I missed your first presentation. A couple of things. Would you put the slide back up that says what music therapy is not? Okay, great. Yes, great. It's interesting because when I get in my car, the first thing I do is turn my music on. And it motivates me. It keeps me thinking on track. But what I'm, I think I'm hearing for clarity is that um, there are specific outcomes, outcome measurements that you look for in what you're doing. Can you walk me through one or two clients, I guess you would say, that you've had where you went from the A to the B, what that outcome was from A to B? Absolutely. Um, I worked with a couple of really um, low-functioning young adults when I worked, when I worked for the um, autism program up in Newark. And right off the top of my head, um, I, while I was looking through, I was going through the assessment process with him, his functioning, I think he had a functioning level of eight years old, but he was 20 years old. And I kept getting a lot of the, you know, he's not going to be able to verbalize, he's not going to be able to express, but we'd like to explore that anyway because he's getting ready to go into the vocational world and he needs to be able to express his needs and demands. So he came to the music therapy session and I, tried, I just tried to do a little bit of assessing with him. And it seemed like he had a very strong affinity or, and interest in the microphone. So I created a, a communication song where I would sing, um, I would sing like a melody and then I would um, vocalize different vowel sounds, consonations, different words for him, and then I would give him the chance to 
imitate what I was expressing to him. And it was a slow process, but he was able to go from a, a primary objective of in, um, expressing the, the sound ba to goodbye and taking objectives and turning them into long-term goals. That, that is one example, being able to take what they're bringing to me and saying, okay, well, I will come up with an activity that encourages him or her to explore or experiment their voice to be able to meet the goals that they're, that's written on their IEP mandated objectives and goals. Now, I went over and above with that client and he was able to say things that they didn't expect him to do. Okay, so that, that particular person is in a group setting consistently? It was a school, yeah. Okay, perfect. Public school. Perfect. Do they pick out the, the uh, instruments that they want to use, or do you do that? Right now, they're kind of limited to what I have, but if in a, in a perfect scenario, they would be able to pick it out through the session. So if, they're, if I see them and they're really, you know, engaged with the tambourine, especially a child with autism, I want to know two things. I want to know, is this something that's a reinforcement for them, or is it something that stems them, something that distracts them from the therapy? So I have to distinguish between what is going to, to get them to um, communicate with me, even if it's nonverbal, or is this going to prevent them from communicating with me? If it doesn't prevent them from communicating with me, I'm going to use this to the full, full advantage and you know, do my turn, your turn, my turn, your turn, and then turn it, maybe turn it into a singing experience, maybe turning it into an improvisation where he's tapping away, and then I stop and see if he's able to integrate what I'm doing. Awesome. Last two questions. Can we talk about fees? Sure. All right. What's the charge? I have an open fee. So typically, I, I look for $25 a half an hour, $40 an hour. That's just what I'm starting with right now, just because I in, in the past, I've come across issues with parents that aren't able to pay a lot of money. So I'm trying to be a little more flexible with that. I know right now, with, with the job that I'm starting in September, for the music school, we're going with, I think, $32 an hour. But that's, that's starting right now, until things get better. And lastly, in Sussex, we have a organization that works with uh, people with disabilities. And there's a conference coming up. I, I believe it's the 25th. Are you attuned to working with uh, organizations? And I know you are with autism and, and the consortium, the consortium. But um, are you also attuned to working with other organizations with disabilities getting on the platform when they have? Okay, can I? Definitely, and, okay. uh, and any, any organization that would like to meet with me or have me in as a speaker, I'm, I'll be glad to do it. It's just I, I, it, I can only go with what responses I'm given. So I've, I've, when I started, when I first moved here, I reached out to a lot of different agencies, and it was just a matter of who responded. And I know on my part, I need to keep I don't want to pester people, but I need to get back on the ball with some people, some individuals. But yeah, I, I definitely am open to working with different agencies. And I'm really motivated. Am I not getting therapy? Okay, it's therapeutic for you. Yes. It's definitely therapeutic, and music has a definite stronghold on, on our mood and our emotions. The difference between mu music therapeutic music and music therapy is that you're not working with a professional who's able to take what you're doing and come to a conclusion with it. To be able to use the experience for specific directed goals. So if you're working with a music therapist and you were listening to the same music, they would talk a little more in depth about why you like the song, what words do you like in the song, why does it, why, why does it remind you of A, B, and C? That clarifies. <laughs> uh, good morning. I was wondering, um, at this point, how are people really connecting and finding out about your service? Uh, is it going through agencies and then the agencies are connecting, or are you doing like marketing yourself to let word out? Yeah, and I've I've been 
putting my putting my name out a lot. I do have a Facebook page that I use to connect with different organizations in Sussex County, and that's where a lot of people have been getting in touch with me. I had a lady in Newcastle, all the way up in Newcastle, contact me about music therapy services for, uh, I think it's a home for, um, in the, I think it's adolescents at, at risk. And I said, you know, I really, I really appreciate the gesture. Unfortunately, it's a little too far away from me right now. But that's where a lot of my contacts are coming from. The contact that I had for the home in Seaford came from my Facebook page. So a lot of people are, are in the professional world are tuning into LinkedIn and Facebook. So I'm using a lot of my social media to connect with individuals, but I'm also giving my card out whenever I'm somewhere where I know that, you know, for instance, the state of Delaware's Deve Department of Developmental Disability Services at, or where I know that there's an autism ball, or I know, like, I'm always bringing my cards with me and talking to people. And that was actually my second question was, um, you mentioned earlier in your presentation about um, the trouble of finding space to be able to meet, and you mentioned meeting at the library now. Are you, are you looking for other space to meet too, maybe to spread out a little bit more in the county and be able to offer you know, another two or three group sessions in the area? Yeah, that's something that I've considered. A lot of, a lot of the organizations that I've talked to, they want me to come to them. So it hasn't been a problem, but it's definitely something that I considered. But getting this music school job has really opened up my abilities. Now, that's not going to be the good part about that is I'll be able to serve individuals. I'll be able to serve families, children, youth on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But it's not Hemlope and Music Therapy. It's their, their organization. The good thing is... You know, I'm an employee of them. The bad thing is I'm, it's not growing him open, but it's helping serve the community. In your example that you gave earlier, it prompts me to ask, have you been in touch with speech therapists in the area? Yes. Good. I was in the process of working with a, a speech language pathologist in Lewis, and that's another situation where her census was dipping, and then she kind of, like, disappeared. But yeah, I've, I've reached out to a lot of speech-language pathologists. I've given my card to a lot of um, clinical psychologists. It's just a matter of you know, them getting back to me and talking to me again. Yeah, I, I encourage you to continue following that. Sometimes that very diplomatic, sweet, but slightly squeaky wheel, um, that if they don't need your services now, when the time comes up that they need it, then you might be the first person that comes to mind. Right, and, that, and that's... Of what happened with me and music school, I contacted them over a year ago, and I heard back from them five months ago, and then we had our, our interview a month ago, I think it was two months ago, and then they offered me the job three weeks ago. So it's just persistence and patience for me, I think, is the most important stepping stone. Another potential lead that comes to mind, are you aware of the Children's Beach House? Yes. And they are expanding their programs into a year-round situation. I haven't heard all of the details, but there might be a, a, a lead for you to check out anyway. Yeah, and I have, I have a lot of contacts through them because of my work with Autism Delaware, so that is something that I'm mulling over, and I know other people that work there, so I'm trying to get my foot in that door. And one more thing before I turn it over to Mr. Mike here. Um, with, you mentioned earlier that you, had, you were a sole proprietor and that you had not ventured into an LLC because you did not anticipate to have employees. As an entrepreneurship instructor, I'd love to chat with you that, about that a little later, uh, mainly because you don't need employees to go to the next step, uh, but you might want to consider some liability protections uh, in that way. I'd be happy to talk to you about that. It just came to me that you're so close to Cadbury in Lewis, and since some extended members of our family are there, and some Rotarians are there, that that just might be a good venue if you're interested in getting introduced to some people there. And you could actually tie that right into being as close as you are with Cape High School that maybe you've already, exp you've already probably checked this out, but if we can be of any help to you, I will. That's a great idea. Other questions? I thought I saw another hand or two. No? 
One advantage that we've had this morning with only having one presenter is that you were able to have extended time. So there are some benefits to that. And to being a small audience, then we all get a chance to ask what's on our mind. Uh, before we conclude, could you please tell us what we as a community can do to help you? The most important thing that you can do for me is just spread the word, like, you know, talk about my practice, talk about what I'm doing. I know this guy, you know, just word of mouth is really important. Being able to, like, hook me up with different contacts, networking, um, find out who knows what around here. I know that I'm definitely further along than I was the last time I came to speak, but it's always a mystery about, you know, where to go next. So being able to just find the right people and connect with the right individuals.